I'm, I'm Amy, I'm a reporter at Sifted. Sifted, if you don't know about Sifted, we are the Financial Times, is a kind of Financial Times spin out and we write about startups and tech around Europe. We've been going for about a year and one of the very first interviews I did was actually I got a nice trip from London to Barcelona to meet Glovo. And before I, before I met Glovo for the first time, I'd, I'd never really heard of you, sorry, Oscar, because <laughs> uh, I live in London and in London we have Deliveroo yeah. and we have Uber Eats. And I, in the Nordics, you also don't have Glovo. Um, but Glovo is kind of a, a kind of hidden, a hidden treat for, for it's, people. It's very hidden, yeah. And uh, I think what's super interesting is you chose not to go to the UK. You chose not to come to yeah. the Nordics. Tell us about, tell us about that. Why, why didn't you even bother going there? Yeah, look, so th to give you some context, um, the beginnings of Global were very humble and let's say not very ambitious. We, we never planned to be a, a global food delivery company. Um, we just find, found ourselves in Spain and Italy with a product that was beating or was better than the local competitors, mm -hmm. which at that time was Uber Eats, uh, Deliveroo, and especially Just Eat. Just Eat was the big player. Um, and we, you know, laser focused on these two countries, Spain and Italy. We had a product that was better in the sense that we deliver everything beyond food, yep. even though we, you know, three quarters or 80% of our orders are food delivery. There's a 20% of the orders that are groceries, pharmacy, you know, send some flowers, which, you know, again, it's only 20%, but emotionally for the user, uh, it weighs a lot, right? Yeah. When you can pick up your keys that you forgot at home, uh, even if it happens once every three months. So once we could crack these two markets, uh, you know, we just got ambitious uh, and we looked at the entire world. Um, we chose to go to LATAM um, and we chose to go to not very competitive markets. That was very clear for us that even though our product is one step further than any other food delivery company in terms of value proposition, um, that's usually not enough to go to a, a city like London yeah. and disrupt uh, a market that is very penetrated on food delivery. Yeah. So you, so so how did you? What like, what went into assessing the kind of countries that you you would go to? Like what what made you decide? Okay, we're going to go to this place in Latin America. So, I mean, there's, there's a very long process of how we green light or red light uh, countries to go to. Uh, the biggest questions we, we ask is, uh, are we going to disrupt, uh, are we going to lead or co-lead the food delivery space? Mm -hmm. um, if it's a clear yes, because either there's no competition or the local competitors, we think they're disruptable, right? They have a service and selection that, it's, that we can beat. Then we usually then we go deeper, then and then we go into you know the unit economics, the legal model, um, the, the the cost, uh, and 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 etc. We we started with Latam yeah. for us, you know, being from Spain, um, was kind of easier for us to to do that move just because of a language and a, a little bit of culture. Um, and we. What was different? What, what did you go to? You went to Latin America and you're like, hey, they speak Spanish. This is going to be easy. Like, what were some things where you were like, oh, this is, this is not Spain? Yeah, I mean, when I, first of all, whenever you get out of uh, uh, Europe, everything around payments and credit cards uh, gets very messed up. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if you want to have a good acceptance rate for any credit card, you need to localize and develop a lot of you know, localized products. That was big. Um, um, and then, you know, we related to payments. When we launched in Argentina, we thought we could run a business without cash. Right. You know, we thought that people would put their cards in, a, in an app that was new to them. And the local teams told us that was a terrible idea. Uh. We launched without, uh, uh, without cash uh, on delivery and, and, and we just had to pull back. Right. And we had to develop cash almost overnight. Uh, so the ability for users to pay with uh, cash. Um, and cash is terribly complex. Now we've built a, 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 a process that is scaling very well. Um, but cash has two secondary effects. One is, so th the fact that our, your couriers are building up cash that they hold in their pockets, one is very, is very dangerous because they, at some point they're going to they're gonna fraud. They're, yeah. gonna, no, they're just going to leave the platform because they're accumulating a lot of cash. Um, two, if the word spreads around the city that all these couriers with the yellow backpacks are, are driving with a lot of cash in their pockets, that's also very dangerous, right? Yeah. Because they, they can get stopped and, and robbed. 
So that, that was probably the, the biggest thing that we had to develop almost overnight. So, so how does it work? How do you stop them all just stealing from you or being stolen from? So we, we've developed a system that is working very well where basically the couriers, um, they deposit cash on every store or restaurant they go to. So there's, there's an algorithm that basically optimizes the, the cash in the pocket to, to the minimal. Right. Uh, so they collect cash from users. And depending on the cash they have, they, they deposit that in, in. So we're using our own partners in the cities, our stores, uh, restaurants or stores, whatever, to, to deposit that cash. OK. And then what, were there any kind of cultural differences in terms of like, how people actually like, use the service or, or what they want delivered that's different? Uh, yeah. So we, we realized that our multi-category value proposition was bigger in, in, in LATAM. Mm -hmm. And then we saw that in, in, in emerging markets as well. And we think that's, that's a, a, simply a culture of it. So in, in Argentina, again, for example, um, everyone there has been used to grocery, pharmacy, flower delivery offline. Right. So everyone had a phone they could call, like, hey, can you bring me this from the pharmacy? Which didn't, doesn't happen in Europe. It just doesn't exist. Yeah. Um, and therefore, the value proposition is a lot more clear for them, right? It's just bringing that experience online. Yeah. So we see higher rates of multi-category or non-restaurants non in, in LATAM. And then culture-wise, not really. It's, it's been more dependent on competition. We've seen more rational and more irrational competition, depending on the market. Um, our biggest surprise was uh, you know, we, we came to realize that it doesn't matter the country, how developed or how emerging it is. Uh, if you offer the right service and selection and pricing for in a, in a big city, food delivery is going to work very well. No? And we, I think we had this you know, light bulb uh, moment when we launched in Morocco, and then we launched in Ivory Coast. Um, that you know, it just worked. There's very big cities. Um, our two fastest growth stories have been in Ukraine and Kazakhstan, okay. um, which is pro which are probably countries that you know, if someone told me that we were or you know, someone told me two years ago that we would be there. Two years ago, I would say no way. Yeah, yeah. But, and what, uh, what else has been tweaked around the the product? I think you told me the way you deliver in Ukraine is different from yeah, based on also. weather. Yeah, uh, Ukraine. No, R Romania was the first country where we had snow. Right. <laughs> uh, and all our fleet was built on bicycles and, and motorbikes. Yeah. So that didn't work for sure. Um, we had to adapt that to, to, to cars. Um, I think now we're in a moment where our product can, can, can launch in any country. You know, we've been in, in cash-heavy markets. We've been in super cold, super hot markets. Um, so where's yeah. next? What, what else is on the, the market hit list? What other, um, so as I said, all these, you know, Kazakhstan, Ukraine have been a great surprise. Countries like Georgia. Um, which are not a focus for most of the global food players. Uh, so we keep looking at that area as potential new launches. We also like Africa a lot. Um, we're now in Morocco, Egypt, Kenya, and Ivory Coast. Um, but you know, we're now at the moment where we're in 26 markets. 2018 was very, very intense in terms of expansion. I think now we're at the moment where you know, we're chilling a little bit on expansion, focusing a lot more in, in, our, in our countries. And there's a lot to expand inside our countries. Now, in Spain, for example, we're in 80 cities. Mm -hmm. And we keep launching a rate of five cities every month. Um, so you know, there's, there's always this uh, conflict that we have internally on time to market is super important. Um, so when you look at Kazakhstan, for example, it's going to be a lot more efficient to go to Kazakhstan today than in a year from now. But then you open another Kazakhstan, and you're going to be you know, spreading a little bit your, your budget, right? And yeah. you're going to be taking a little bit of your money from, from Spain, from Italy, from these core markets. So it's a very, it's a very hard decision. We usually go for the aggressive one. Um, but I think we've gone already quite far. How, um, how small can you go? How, how, how small a city does it make sense for you to, like you said, you're, yeah. you're kind of spreading your team, you're spreading your energy every time. Like how, when do you stop? That's a question that we still haven't answered. Uh, again, we still haven't found the limit um, of in what size of city does you know, building a, a fleet of couriers make sense, because there's just, you're never going to build enough capillarity or, or efficiency. 
in Spain, we're now launching cities of uh, 50,000 couriers. Yeah. Sorry, 50,000 50, population. Um, and we're seeing good economics. So that's the last thing we, the last limit that we have for now. Okay, and and so when you when you move to a new market, so when you went to Kazakhstan, for example, yeah. like who, what does that actually mean? Who goes there? Who runs that? Like how how do you find tell the people of Kazakhstan that yeah. they can join Glovo and become a courier? So that that's uh, that's that's I think one of the things we've done the, the best uh, I think because in. It was right after cracking Spain and Italy that we realized that, hey, if you go into a market and we go very fast, uh, it, where, in markets where food delivery is still not disrupted, we're going to build very efficiently a very solid business. In all of, but we had to run a lot because we had Uber Eats and, and other global players also expanding. Yeah. What we did was we started building a, a launchers uh, training school in Barcelona, our headquarters. So we just looked for very smart, young, uh, very resourceful people uh, that basically signed up for an, for, for an adventure. Uh, and we trained them for two months. Uh, culture was very important. So we yeah. insisted on culture, because at the end of the day, these are the launchers that are, are going to be building teams. And this is what allowed us to you know, have, like a, in, in parallel, a lot of different launchers uh, going to green light or red light, and then launch a new country. They're the first ones to hit the ground. They're the first ones to start hiring, building the operations. And usually, they, they take um, two months since they hit the ground to, to launching. And then they move. They are basically nomads. OK. Uh, and what do they do in those two months? What are, they, what are they getting in place? What are they figuring out? So we're a three, we're a three side marketplace, right? We have users, partners, and, and couriers. The last one, couriers, you can build up very fast. In most of our markets, there's a lot of demand for people looking for flexible jobs. Mm -hmm. So you can open up uh, slots of you know, jobs in, in any you know, job portal. And you, you get a lot of uh, requests. In, you, know, you can do that in the last two weeks. Um, at the beginning, it's, it's most, mostly about building the partners, the restaurants, and other stores uh, list, and start signing all those, those partnerships. Um, and then, of course, what comes last is, is uh, the, the users. Right? Okay. Once you've launched. You soft launch first, and then you, we, we start building uh, in market. And they do a lot of hiring. How, um, how, many, how many different markets might they open? Do they burn out? <laughs> they burn out, and we've tracked this. And it's, it's part of the plan. Uh, we've seen some people burning out after two or right. three. Uh, we have some anomalies that they're still launching countries, and they love it uh, as a way of living. Um, the thing is, this, these people, these launchers, they built so much experience at the local level that headquarters doesn't have, yeah. that they always, they always find amazing opportunities in headquarters. Now, so whenever they say, hey, this, 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 is, I mean, this is enough, yeah. they go back and take uh, cool, cool roles in headquarters. What kind of roles do they take when they retire? <laughs> uh, so a lot of operations, a lot of sales. Uh, some of them, they, 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 they just love so much one of the countries they, they, they launched that uh, they stayed as, as country managers. Okay. Um, yeah. And are there any, what countries have you, you kind of investigated or even launched in that just haven't worked out? So our most expensive or cheap uh, learning was Brazil. Okay. What happened in Brazil? Um, what happened in Brazil? Uh, so we, when we were, it was at the beginning of, you know, let's, get, let's go global. And when we got very ambitious, we looked at Brazil and there was a local competitor there called uh, iFood. And we said, look, iFood is one of these generation one companies, similar to Just Eat, uh, <laughs> terrible product, bad service. We can disrupt it with our, with, our, with our product. We went there, and we realized it was a very different story. Now, iFood was amazing in, in everything that I just said, in service, in selection, in pricing, a lot of budget. Um, uh, plus, just the cost of running a business in, in, in Brazil, uh, people-wise, um, and, and media, media-wise, are super, super expensive. So it was a, it was a very, it was a very expensive um, learning. We almost burned like 20 million there, but wow. we were quite fast. So, yeah. so how, when did you go in, and when did you get out? We went in on January. We decided to go out on September. Yep. We tried to solve whatever we had built, which was not bad, um, in terms, of, especially in terms of partners and service and 
we couldn't. There was no interest, and we just pulled back. Okay. Um, we know of another, another competitor of us that entered at the same time. They're burning 20 million every month there, and there's, I think they still have very low chances of winning. So that's why I say it was a very expensive learning, but in some, yeah. you know, in some uh, sense, it was also very cheap. So to, to go back to the beginning of Grovo, obviously you're in a super, super competitive market. Um, and I know it was hard to raise money yeah. at the start. How, how, when you're kind of a few years behind the competition, they've raised loads of money, how yeah. the hell do you go to investors and convince them, like, I know we're late to the party, but honestly, <laughs> give us a shot. Give us a shot, yeah. I mean, reality is that we didn't convince them, uh, <laughs> most of them. <laughs> we, we've had, we've had uh, terrible times at, with fundraising. It's been really, really tough. Um, I remember our Series B was probably the toughest because it, it was in this moment when uh, the local ecosystem for, in Spain was definitely not enough. We were trying to raise between 10 and 20. And in Spain at that time, you could maximum do like, you know, raise a maximum 5 million. Um, and when you went to London or Paris, they just looked at you like, you know, who are you? You know, this is Spanish business. Um, we were trying to raise 15 million. Uh, Deliveroo had just announced, uh, I think, 400 million. <laughs> um, so we, I think I read a, I read a blog uh, post on, on our fundraise because we, we got no's from 116 VCs. You got no's from 116. And it wasn't just emails. It was like going to present or, or calls or pitch, 116. And then magically, we had a Rakuten. Um, that had invested a little bit on mobility, and they liked a lot the space. Um, and Miki Tani, the, the, the founder, he said, look, our next move is, is, is delivery. We want to test delivery. Uh, Miki Tani, is, is, he loves Barcelona. He has invested in the soccer team. And they got to know us. They really liked the business. And, and they decided to invest very, very last minute. We were, you, were, were you just lucky, or did you somehow pitch them differently? or? I think, Had you like given up, so you were just yeah. it was somehow easy. <laughs> I think I think we're by far like the one of the most efficient delivery businesses in the world, if not the most, by you know how much GMB we've built versus a burn. So we've done things very well, but we've been extremely lucky. So in in three rounds, we were maybe weeks away from from having to shut down. So in in some sense, that's what I tell myself every day. I think yes, we, we've been lucky. And you, um, you recently bought a company, didn't you, in Poland to expand yeah. your engineering team. Tell us a bit about the kind of the, the dev side of Glovo. Um, so you, in, in the, our deal in, in Poland? Yeah. It, yeah, so we, we bought a pizza portal. It's the second player. Uh, Poland is a market which is super underpenetrated. Um, we think the, the, the local the bigger player there is also disruptable through uh, you know, just building a better service. And, and we thought that what Pizza Portal had in terms of you know, user base, uh, exclusive partnerships, uh, was very powerful. Plus, um, our tech team is still quite small. And you know, we, we, we're, we're, in, we're building it in Barcelona. But we thought having two hubs was something uh, good to test. So we, we've kept the, their tech team, the Pizza Portal team, and we're building a second hub in in, in Warsaw. And what kind of like technical things can you bring in to make Glovo even more efficient and, and profitable? The biggest thing is is drops per hour. Um, the second, uh, which is which we are behind. So we've we've we hadn't we haven't invested uh, enough uh, versus what other competitors have done. Uh, well, here you guys have Walt, which is a, a great example of of a high you know really good algorithms and drops per hour. We're still a bit behind, um, and we're, I think now we have the right team. We're going to correct that in the next 12 months. Um, the second thing is uh, food delivery or anything delivery just has so many more variable costs, especially live operations. So there's, mm -hmm. a, there's a team of outsourced, uh, f I think, 3,000 agents, um, and our cost is still like uh, almost 40 cents per, per order. Um, that's huge when you're doing almost 10 million orders per month. It's a huge cost. So, um, and that's a big focus for us next year. You know, we want to uh, prepare the company so that by the end of next year, um, Q3 
keep growing. We're still growing very fast, like almost more than 200% year on year. But we want to prepare the company so that by December, um, we can decide to go profitable. OK. Um, and so, you, so you're expanding to different markets. You're expanding into in, like for deeper in the markets you're already in. Tell us about you're also doing dark kitchens. Yeah. And you're also doing like on-demand grocery. Yeah. We're a lot more excited with the second. Uh, we did the first because we saw a lot of competitors doing it, so we wanted to test it. Um, and it's going well. We have eight dark kitchens that basically we add our, our, we invite our best partners in the city to take a slot in our dark kitchens. That it's a service for our, our favorite partners that they like. What we're more excited about is, is our grocery business. Um, and, and, and there we're doing two things. One is we're partnering with the biggest retailers in the world, with uh, you know, Carrefour's and Walmart's, uh, so that the users can find their brands in, in our app. But what we're, we're, we're investing more time and resources is our, our warehouses. So we were starting to build, uh, one year ago, we started to build uh, dark stores in the city, which is uh, like a 7-Eleven like a uh, type of store, uh, dark, so closed, uh, not dark. And, and we stock between 1,000 and 2,000 SKUs. Um, what this allows us to do is um, a lot better service. So now in Barcelona, for example, we, we're building enough capillarity so that we can guarantee 15-minute delivery time for any grocery order. Uh, we think this is big. Uh, today, delivery time is around 25, which is it's decent. Um, and, and yeah, we, we have like 10 around the world. It's, it's a model that we're very excited about. Why, why does it make sense for you? You know, that's a whole other like, can of worms to open up. You've got to deal with like, fresh food. You, yeah. You've got to make it still super fast. You've got your couriers going to restaurants and already going to pharmacies and flower shops, and now also these stores. Yeah. Like, why, why do it? <laughs> um, it? For sure, all this multi-category adds a lot of inefficiency. I think we're just following what our users are telling us. Right Before we started doing dark stores, uh, people were already ordering uh, a lot of uh, grocery orders. And usually it's your, your highest quality users, those that are multi-category, they have a much higher lifetime value and, and much higher quality. So we're just improving the service through building dark stores or, or other things, um, assuming you know, this cost of extra inefficiency. Yeah. And what, do you think that will work equally well across the world in all your different markets? Are there some markets? To, to the store. Um, so I do think maybe more emerging markets, the adoption is, we're seeing faster adoption on groceries and other categories. Uh, Spain and Italy, they're also catching up and they're going to take a, a, a bit longer. Okay. And what about the dark kitchens? You said you're not as excited about them as Deliveroo and Uber Eats yeah. seems to be. Why, why is that? So we're very excited about um, food delivery as an industry uh, moving slowly or fast towards more dark kitchen businesses. Because it, it, it just makes the, the entire industry more efficient. The cost for our partners go down. These cost efficiencies will, will end up passing into the user, so users will be able to eat for delivery cheaper. Mm -hmm. That's great that it's happening. My, what we're still discussing is, you know, are we going to be a real estate company, right? With you know, Travis Kalanick and, and all these other companies raising money now to, to build really good dark kitchens for restaurants. Um, are we really going to be able to, you know, to have dark kitchens that, that are as good as them? Um, that's an open question that we have today. And, and I'm sure, you know, Will Shu also has it. Yeah. Um, but, you know, it's, it's, it, the reality is it's quite cheap to test and run. Okay. And, and so Glovo is the kind of everything app. That's your, your kind of line. Yeah. Where, where else can that go? Like we've spoken about dark kitchens, we've spoken about grocery. There's all the things you already deliver. What, yeah. what else can be kind of taken around? Um, I think any, any, uh, how, how we look at our vision is any, th any pain point for a citizen, we want to solve it, right? Or we want to digitalize it. Uh, imagine things like reservations, ticketing, home services. No? You need a, a cleaning service or, or, or fixing anything at home. We just launched a very small test in Argentina uh, where we added uh, scooters. In our, we bought uh, 300 scooters. Like, we, the, like the kick scooters? Kick scooters, yeah. Okay. <laughs> we, it, was a, it was a test. We don't plan to, to go into uh, operators. But so we this isn't, Glovo isn't spinning out to become a scooter business as no, well? No, <laughs> but look, we, we thought, let's test it. It was very cheap to, to, to launch it. And 
if it works, why not start building a, a, a marketplace huh? and integrating with reality is people open our app every three days in average, right? That's a very high frequency app. So you can start adding anything that you can think of for a, for a citizen. But I think our big focus today is groceries. Okay. Um, is there, is there, there's nothing else around, like what, what else can be transported or what, I guess is the goal for you to be an app that people open every day, every few hours? Like, what's the, what's the, the goal there? Um, we haven't defined it that way for now. Um, we do track very, very, very hard the, the, the percentage of users that move to other categories. Because we know that when they do this jump, uh, their lifetime value goes, will go up a lot. No? They, it becomes a much more sticky app. Yeah, OK. Final question, the tricky yeah. one, food delivery. It's been very hard for people to become profitable yeah. in lots of their markets. Like, how are you actually going to do that? I think there's a lot of companies making a lot of profit with uh, food delivery, both generation one and generation two. Uh, we have a couple of countries that are not only cross margin, but, but bottom line a bit that profitable. Um, and I think it's a matter of time. You know, I think uh, launching these businesses in new cities, building the right efficiency in capillarity takes time. Uh, as I said, in Spain, you know, we're still launching 10 cities every week, every month. Uh, so every new city, you have to start from zero and with very negative uh, margins. Um, so I think it's a matter of time. OK, amazing. Um, final plug from me. Um, we at Sifted have just written a big report on the food delivery sector. So if you're interested, please head to our website, sign up to receive it. There's an interview with Oscar there for more. <laughs> Thank Thanks. You.